I have Clarissa Grande's books here. And I'm going to show them to you. What I have here is the Clarissa Grande's Artful Math Activity Book and Teacher's Book. Now this was originally published in England, so it's published under the, the name of the Artful Maths Book. They took the S off to the United States, which was very nice because we don't say maths. And there's just a few little things in here that are a dead giveaway that it wasn't published in this country, but that's neither here nor there at the moment. So I did these. I didn't want to do a review of this without, I didn't want to share this until I actually did every page. I started at the back, which she's done. Well, let me look at the table of contents first with you. She got the most beautiful table of contents. And there's six sections. And each one of them has a drawing activity which relates to a math concept. She talks about the math concept, both in the book and in the teacher's book. I'm not going to be talking about that because it would make this way too long. But the idea for me is that if you introduce someone to art that's mathematically based, it gets them more interested in math, makes it more friendly, which it should be, because what math does is it allows you to do more things than you could do before. Um, I didn't do these in order, and you don't have to. I started with the parabolic curves. Um, I have these, uh, I use my little tools a lot because I worked in the book. You don't have to work in the book. You can download any of the pages. Uh, when you buy the book, you also get access to prints of the pages. And you can also print right from the page because it's a nice size for doing that. And she wants you to do that. So, um, and, but I recommend using, getting little tools because little tools are so nice to use. Um, I used uh, some markers on this one, and I used different tools. I, I, since I was working in the book, I didn't want the uh, inks to se seep through, so I tested them, and then some of them did seep through, but it were on pages I didn't care that much about preserving, the ones that I have art on. And so she starts off with parabolic curves, which is a system of adjoining points, straight lines, to make things that are curvy. And uh, the, this actually did leak through more than I wanted to, so I ended up doing all sorts of extra designs on that to sort of hide it. One thing that was really interesting to me about the activity of doing this is that even though I understood, when, I, when I read the directions and I understood what to do, I thought, oh, fine, I can, I can just do it. But it wasn't that easy. I made all sorts of mistakes. It really does take a certain kind of focus to do this, and that develops. So... If you're working with students or just talking to yourself, it's important to keep in mind that that you're going to make mistakes unless you stay focused. And that focus, that type of focus, uh, is becomes um, uh, learned. It's it's developed. So anyhow, I did a few of these, and there's so many different decisions. So you're starting with just a, a rule. You're following the rule and the form, but there's infinite numbers of ways you can personally go with this. Uh, yeah, so I so this is this is the this um this is one I thought was going to leak through, but it didn't. And in the back, she's got how to do a lot of the basic instructions that she uses inside of the book. Uh, for this particular activity, I didn't need anything but a straight edge and whatever marking tools I was using. For the most part, I used color pencils. So after I did the parabolic curves, the next one I did was epicloids, which is one thing you'll know, be able to decipher, is this is 2N mod 60. I didn't know what that really meant or how to express this when I began. But like I guess I'm not going to be talking about the math, because, but it becomes really obvious what it is. This is, again, this is just joining up numbers and points and points to points according to a rule in a circle and again these even though there's this very specific rule to create a very specific look there's so many ways you can go with these things to make just an infinite number of designs I, i'd love to do this with a class i would love to do this a class and see all the different things the kids would come up with so there were three epicloids in this section Next, I did mazes. Okay, you can see I did use Sharpie here, and it came all the way through, but I didn't care because once I followed 
the once I understood the, the method I really didn't need to see this anymore and I didn't think I was gonna like the mazes and I loved the mazes okay uh, she has a wonderful way of doing it it's of explaining it it does require that you use a pencil to to um, shade in a lot of things and then go back and erase and one thing that's really nice about this paper is that it erases nicely now I always use a good eraser um, in the work and you know erasers on the backs of pencils can be sketchy but I rarely recommend that you get a nice a good eraser because there's a bunch of things in the book that it's helpful to do the pencil drawing and then go back and, and erase and this is definitely one of them it's a wonderful method of making mazes I would have never thought of it I just love doing it these squares are a little bit bigger than these squares but that makes this one a lot more complex this is actually done with um, I think this is actually with just a regular ink pen but this is Sharpies and I love the little squares so this one is actually very easy to solve as a maze this one is not very easy and it actually took quite a bit of time to do but I could really see a certain kind of kid really getting into this kind of thing because it takes a long time takes a lot of focus and it's really tricky so then the next one in this chapter was the seven circuit labyrinth which I was not familiar with um, but it was it was fun I, I was concerned with this one because um, I was afraid that my compass wouldn't open big enough to do it and I was and just by looking at it I was pretty sure it was going to go off the page which I was worried about well turns out my compass wasn't big enough to do it but it didn't matter because once I got the general look of it then uh, it was easy enough to just sketch in about where the other ones should be and as far as it going off the page yeah it went off the page I don't care it turns out that you can work this labyrinth and use it and there's enough in here for it to for you to find your way around and of course you can then bring it out into the world maybe into a bigger piece of paper or even a yard and create this thing uh, it's a very cool it's a, it's a very cool labyrinth that like I said I'd never seen before many of these things in the book I have seen before but I've never really gotten into them and I have never really looked closely at them and understood them and that's what this was a really good book for um, a case in point was the next one so we've all seen this kind of like Fibonacci spiral golden spiral and I didn't re I've never made one and uh, it was, it was, um, this is a funny thing to make because she has these directions, but I didn't read them very carefully. So I started making lots of mistakes. So starting with a pencil and erasing was a very good idea here. Uh, but then once I realized I was going to run, completely run out, uh, of room, I went back and looked and precisely, uh, followed her directions on how to do this. And it worked out just fine. Again, my compass wasn't big enough. But once I start, started seeing the pattern, it was easy enough to trace it in myself. What I really liked about this one, too, is that she has these, these other ways of, of creating them and different kinds of designs you can do basically with the same idea. And I, I love these down here, these little, these little guys. Okay, so I was working backwards up to here, but now I went forward. But, oh, I wanted to point out something that in the epicoid section this was one of the funniest things about uh, the English-American divide down here she it says to there's there's um, a lot of things that where you can push these further and here it says explore use a torch to generate a, a cardioid inside a glass of water and I just wanted to let Clarissa know that in this country, we generally don't recommend children to use torches. I think she meant flashlight, but um, I thought that was quite funny. I had to look that up. It's like, what? Okay, Curves of Pursuit. I have played around with Curves of Pursuit a little before. I like them, but I never really got intimate with them like I did in this book because she has a bunch of them. And I really got to know, understand them. And again, this is one of those things that ha you 
follow a very specific direction and you can do infinite number of different things with them. So she starts out with a square one and goes into the triangle one, which is just beautiful. Then um, this one, she asks that you use a step length, and you'll know when you understand, after you've done a few, of uh, 0.5 centimeters, which I found to be really kind of like difficult to do with like a ruler and to keep doing that. So what I did, is I tore off a corner of the page, and actually have the corner somewhere, but I don't know what I did with it now. But I tore off a corner of the page. I measured um, a centimeter. Here, I'll do it here with this. I measured off one centimeter. And you'll have to have a centimeter ruler to do it, but or you can just do... Um, what would this be about uh, this is about a little less than a half an inch or you can do a half an inch and then when I did my oh this is ha she said half a centimeter that's even smaller so about a quarter of an inch so I made my little mark and then when I did my uh, measuring I just used this as a template um, all the way around and I, I really recommend that because otherwise you'll be unhappy trying to uh, keep looking at the ruler and maybe making mistakes. I didn't color this one in because there were just way too many lines. Um, and here's a couple more. This is based on hexagon. This is probably my uh, favorite page in the book. I didn't do it like she did it. I didn't realize it. But again, if I want to do it again, no problem. I can either just trace this, uh, trace this hexagon or I can download from the download page another one of these to do another one. Last one I saved for last was the impossible objects. I like impossible objects, but I also like possible objects. And I loved the method she used to make these because what you can do, and by the way, this is the tools that I used, what you can do with this method that she shows is you can make this is the method you can make the impossible objects and she has a bunch shown over here or you can make possible objects if I were doing this with kids which I hope to do I would make the possible objects first because they are just as exciting as the possible impossible ones to actually make them and have it look that way uh, but here's mine and here's another one of mine uh, what was nice about this one especially was that I like the fact that she shows exactly what it's supposed to look like. And on this one, I particularly like that because I wanted to color it in, practice different ways of coloring it in to see what would sort of make sense with the picture, uh, to keep it tricky and to make it possible to draw. So that was really helpful. The very last page that I did in this book, the very last page of activity, was... Um, she said to, she, she uh, supplied a isometric grid and suggested to, to do a large one of these. But since it was the very last page in the book for me, I wanted to do something special and I'd sort of gotten the idea of it. So I did something kind of big and uh, unusual. And personally, I like this one upside down a lot. <laughs> but this is the way that I did it. And this is the last page that I did. Okay, so that's the book. And there's, like I said, so much to do in here. Just love doing these. Uh, I think that's my favorite spread. And then there's the teacher's book. I'm not going to go over this too much, but um, it does give you access to um, to te how to teach these learning objective resources. Um, what to do if you've got uh, learners who are younger or who are more experienced, so the different extensions. There is uh, access to uh, the PowerPoint. So if you want to teach by PowerPoints, which are fully editable, ed ed not editable, um, fully editable. And uh, yeah, so it's a whole complete package. Absolutely love having this in my library. Can't wait to get my hands on some groups of kids to do the to show them this